Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik, and today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome Spencer Hiligas, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Hi, Spencer. You are. Mike, great to be here. Really appreciate you having me on. Thank you kindly for coming on a podcast. Um, Spencer hails from the San Francisco Bay Area. He's a past technology um What's the best word for it? Veteran, like me. I, I spent 15 years in technology. You spent 13 years in technology. And while you were a uh, technology junkie, guru, executive, you uh, went into real estate uh, originally passively. And then at some point, you switched and uh, became full-time real estate investor, syndicator, and so on. So tell folks a little bit about your family first. Uh, you, you have a lovely wife, uh, a few wonderful kids. Tell about that, and then we'll jump into uh, your journey in the uh, real estate adventure. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, great common ground, Mike, in terms of the the technology journey. Uh, I look back fondly at that. I know a lot of folks in the real estate and entrepreneurship world tend to talk about the W-2 in a uh, kind of a derogatory way almost. And I I look back actually very positively on on that experience uh, with the technology world, all the relationships, the people I met, the learnings the frameworks, all those things. And they all feed into the journeys and the paths that we take, right? So these days, as you said, I sit in Silicon Valley, little cool island called Alameda, right across from San Francisco and Oakland. And I lead Madison Investing, which is a passive investor club. Um, You know, years ago, I grew up in a real estate household. My dad was a broker. That's all that I knew. You know, he, he, of real estate, he had me work in open houses as a kid and teenager. So technically, I guess I've been in real estate since the age of six. I don't think that counts for much educationally, of course. Uh, but you know, now the quick anecdote I'll share, Mike, is that uh, just this summer we went and lived. My family, Jennifer uh, and our boys, we went and lived in a different country for about two months. That is unheard of lifestyle stuff that we never could have done in my former technology career. When you know, I was working eighty hours a week in an office, not accounting the, the nighttime email laptop opening to <laughs> to follow up on items. And so this whole new, you know, lifestyle uh, is enabled by this wonderful thing of of passive investing through one lens or another, you know, and, and living in Portugal for for a couple of months, showing our children a new way to live, uh, you know, expanding the worldview while working abroad. I guess the kids would call that the, the digital nomad lifestyle, right? These days, that is the culmination of all these wonderful, you know, twists and turns in the journey. And so, yeah, we did in fact start as passive investors. You know, we bought a local rental. We were scared of buying something far away. That was like phase one, uh, if you were to call it that. Wasn't that clear at the time. Phase one, bought a local rental, paid $430,000 for that. That's a Bay Area price in California. Um, cash flows, we still have it now. Cash flows, 200, 250 bucks a month. That's what you, not what you call a cash flow win. Uh, <laughs> it's called tuition. I'm I'm too fam- I'm too familiar. I live in in New York City. It's a very similar experience. The investments here don't really cash flow, so right. I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, so you worked in technology, and you speak of technology obviously gently and and kindly. And I, I had the same experience. I had a great journey in technology. I enjoyed it, but like you said, at some point you get sick and tired of. Uh, 80 hour weeks or 60 hour weeks or 70 hour weeks in the, the evenings. So at some point, uh, it's a lifestyle uh, choice. And um, I'm glad you are where you are today. So let's talk a little bit about your journey in real estate investing. So you started with the, with the rental. <laughs> yep. And in the Bay Area, in the New York City area, few things cash flow. You pretty much buy for appreciation. That's about it. You're just paying down the mortgage and you... Uh, Keep um, waiting for the values to keep push, you know, to to the tide that that rises all boats. So that aside, <laughs> right. how did how did you get into uh, other passive investing? What do you do today? Just uh, you got an investment club where mm-hmm. you share your experience with folks, and then uh, what kind of investments have you been uh, writing your check into in the last few years? And you know, what, and obviously we'll talk about the past, and then we'll switch and talk about the future. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, and so you know, briefly, uh, you know, I mentioned phase one was buying that rental. I look back now, 
with clarity, right? We all have that hindsight 2020. Um, at the time, entrepreneurship and investing is murky, right? You, you learn as you go, you learn as you experience, you learn by skinning your knees figuratively, you learn by talking to others who have gone through it already. And by reading and podcasts such as this, wonderful educational resources from experienced folks like yourself, Mike. Um, but three phases in hindsight didn't feel that way at the time. Bought the rental, that was phase one. We were too scared to buy sight unseen. We then went through and did what I think a lot of folks do. You know, I've talked to thousands of investors now, those that invest alongside us across the country. And this is a common experience, right? We said, let's go buy something that is relatable still, but far away, more affordable than like the New York market, the California market. So we built a little portfolio of up to five single family rentals. And those were all based out in Kansas City, Missouri. Those economics, quite a bit more favorable. <laughs> <laughs> those, the cash flow are... is definitely better. Cash, people I mean, know them as turnkeys, but people have been buying turnkeys for a long time. And and uh, I assume that's, you know, you buy a thousand miles away and there's a management company and you keep running those. Okay, that's the phase two. Continue. Yeah, you know, 60K a pop on average, 250 bucks a month cash flow. Sounds great. But then you also learn rentals are semi-passive at best. Full stop. You know, and, and I'm always happy to talk to folks about that because they're like, well, rentals are passive. I'm like, well... I haven't found a fully hands-on passive property manager yet. So, uh, you know, we ended up selling those and, and we're happy with how that went. Ultimately, we started getting to phase three, investing as LPs in, in multifamily deals and then self-storage. And this is when I was working full-time still, Mike. You know, I was working inside the guts of actually, at the time, the biggest fix and flip lender for single family homes in the country. I went in there because I was brought in to grow their origination groups. And I had never worked in a lender I was, I'm a financial tech guy. I'd grown big customer experience and sales groups and customer support, but I saw the economics on these fix and flip operations. I saw, wow, these, these players are doing really wonderful things, but I can't swing a hammer. I'm not handy. I rely on YouTube every day to fix stuff around my house. <laughs> so, you know, I, but I, I saw the economics and I was like, there's something to learn here. So long story short, that brought me down the rabbit hole. You know, I listened to, I think over 400 podcasts, you know, in, in a year, uh, read over 24 books in 18 months. That's a lot for me, all related to finance, investing, uh, real estate investing. And I just got it when it came to the larger assets, right? I like, it's, it was easier to wrap my head around um, with the economics. I knew how to read a, read an Excel sheet, right? From, from being an operations leader. So that, that all clicked and then started deploying capital into multifamily deals and, uh, and eventually self-storage. Those, those two asset classes now have been the core focus of our group. And uh, what we do is in Madison Investing, we invest our own money personally in teams that we've gotten to know, you know, and, and we vet them, you know, I'll fly out, look at their assets. Uh, and that model has served us well and our investors have built trust kind of the old school way, which is one person at a time, one relationship at a time. Uh, and that's continued to serve us well. And our investors just let us know that by coming back and, and investing alongside us in other deals. And so right now we've We've expanded beyond just those core asset classes, but I think uh, those are still at, at at the core investment thesis of what I believe in uh, for so many so many wonderful reasons. But I digress. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate those those great comments. So certainly concur with you with, with your conclusion. At some point, uh, it's funny how you said it that these passive turnkeys are, are really never passive, and they're semi passive and some points you realize that uh, there are tenants and toilets and even though you're managing the manager, sometimes the managers mismanage the property and you have to deal with those assets and That's sometimes right. tenants leave and they leave, unfortunately, like pigs and then you get a property to fix up and it's all it's all in you. So I, I've had that experience years ago too and I, I certainly uh, I can understand. And let's now dive into multifamily storage and other things you do. So. Uh, these are fundamentally um, these are commercial asset classes. Um, people talk about commercial and they often um, group everything together. So commercial is a broad strategy, but multifamily and storage appear to be very predictable, steady, eddy type of investments. And they've been um, uh, growing steadily over the years, although we've seen some volatility in pricing um, yep. uh, recently. So just just curious, what's been your journey with the investments you made in the last few years? Um, it, this is not to complain or not. Majority of folks who've invested and got floating rate debt, they are feeling the pain of high interest rates, especially yep. any kind of value add projects. 
if you were fortunate enough to buy fixed rate um, investments, at least you bought, you got long term debt, and it's got a few more years before it matures. The experience is uh, feels a little, little, little uh, a lot better. Just curious, what what what, what you've seen then? What's your forward outlook? Um, the on a, I'll just make this comment. On the fundamental supply demand side, I mean, real estate is all local, but um, there's been slowdown in, in the growth of, of supply because of the high interest rates. And as long as you buy uh, fundamentally sound assets on a long-term basis, things should work out well. But in the short run, <laughs> the experience is much higher interest rates, much higher cost of debt. The cap rates expanded or expanding. It's unclear where things are going to go. So just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you hit so many of the key ones that folks should just keep in mind that I'm certainly watching like a hawk, as are you, Mike. I mean, in the current market context, I think knocking on every piece of wood that I have right here, you know, we haven't experienced any issues across our whole portfolio for things such as capital calls. Um, you know, interest rate caps are a beautiful thing if needed. Uh, but also, I think right now, looking across the market, uh, the biggest opportunity in terms of acquisition right now is finding those opportunities on the buying side, right? As an investor going into a deal right now, uh, there's even been ones this year uh, going into it where we are pleased because we get a discount on on buying an asset that it's a challenging situation for the seller. Um, of course, you know, that's not to be celebrated, but at the same time on the buying side, man, it's a great investment opportunity for myself and for our group and for others that see, well, there, is, there are those sellers and those deals emerging where they're under true distress because of their debt situation. Um, you know, there was no interest rate cap in place. They had bridge debt in place. Uh, and as a, as a result of that, could be sitting in a great market. Uh, and they are now positioned <laughs> positioned well for us, those of us on the buying side. There are a couple of markets that we fundamentally have believed in over the course of the last you know six, seven years now. Uh, and I'm grateful that we leaned into them. You know, you and I, I think you Which mentioned, like we, uh, we, we've we always been a fan of, you know, like the broader Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, MSA, you know, you got challenges that have popped up such as like higher insurance costs um, and, and those things. But frankly, that's a business friendly climate. Um, it's a business friendly climate, strong fundamentals, depending on the niche and sub market you look into. And so those are places that I still see a very bright future. Um, you know, we've also been in places across the broader Sun Belt, um, you know, all the way out to, you know, Georgia, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina. And there, yeah, you see some volatility depending on the market, a lot of supply. And, and you already know this and your, and your listeners are sophisticated, Mike, but the, uh, you know, there's a lot of buildings that came complete in some other markets. And in those markets, we're seeing some rent softening for sure. Uh, but to your point, all the interest rate pain right now that is caused in the market is also caused like a close to a dead stop on new construction because it's so hard to get construction financing. So like a lot of the new starts uh, have really plummeted. Um, so if we can just see it through those willing to take the long view, those willing to actually look beyond this moment in time, you know, look toward 2025 and beyond, there's a lot of really great assets to be able to, to go and acquire as long as you're able to put the right structure in place on that deal. So I think that's that's my current thought, very similarly aligned to you, I think, uh, based on your comments a moment ago. And that's what we see. Um, I, I think a little less focused right now on, you know, or I'll just say more vigilant um, in certain markets when it comes to, you know, Florida markets in the Southeast, when it comes to unmitigated, uh, you know, climate weather events, if the insurance structure isn't sound, uh, because that stuff is definitely a moving target for sure. But we've leaned heavily into into Dex Dallas, Texas, uh, and then all the way out to Georgia, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, some of the Rockies as well, you know, but cautiously, um, I, I think in terms of uh, Colorado, I used to live there for 10 years, so I'm always biased toward Colorado, but uh, Sunbelt is where it's been at for us. Yeah, I appreciate that clarification. And um, yeah, I happen to agree on a long-term basis. The uh, environment is certainly uh, such that uh, one of the questions actually came up, one of the strategic calls, uh, what's going to happen in five years? The five-year outlook is, is still pretty good and healthy, but uh, <laughs> you got to survive the short, uh, short uh, term. And you're right, uh, you put it gently, but one person's problem and another person's opportunity, and that's that's the case. If you can give it, you can pick up a quality asset from a distressed seller versus distressed asset from <laughs> from a distressed seller. Yes, you could, you could do well, but it's it, it's not that trivial. Uh, but it, the opportunities are coming up. But in a let me put it this way, 
Uh, I've seen this song before, and my observation is uh, people are waiting for blood in the streets. The blood in the streets is not happening. So there are surgical mm. precision deals showing up here and there uh, from time to time. That was a the other big it. issue, it's way, way, way difficult to find um, uh, financing and raise equity. I had a mm. conversation with a fund manager yesterday or the day before yesterday who uh, does self-storage. She's a specialist in self-storage, pretty successful operator. And um, we just were chatting and said, hey, are you seeing great deals? Like, what do you, you know, what do you need to make as an investor? I said, well, if I'm, if I'm going to write an equity check now, I want returns um, to basically to us, 20% plus at the very minimum. So deal mm. level IRRs have to be is in the mid to high 20s. Uh, of course, most of the deals do have a uh, four or five year horizon. So you got to get to two and a half X uh, equity multiple at least, right? And you're doing this with low leverage. It gets so hard. He said, it's impossible, close to impossible. Uh, you need to buy very, very deep, but the cap rates are not, uh, they haven't expanded in storage. So mm. as an example, as a class, uh, getting the, uh, these type of transactions is very, very difficult. It's just, uh, yes. so it's kind of the conversation and multifamily a little different because you you had a lot more bridge debt floating in multifamily. So there's, there are more opportunities that are pressured uh, by variable rate debt. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. So storage seems to be, you know, if you find a great deal, I want to hear about it. On the other <laughs> side, multifamily, it's quiet. It's been quiet too. So, I, I concur with you that, and this is, I don't know if you're seeing this, but we are seeing quite a bit of opportunities to invest in mezzanine debt. I'm just curious if you, mm. um, many deals that pr will provide greater level of return on a risk adjusted basis than equity. So mezz debt, you can get 18% type mm. of a return, maybe some current, some back end. And in equity, getting 18, 20% today is super hard unless you buy super deep. So in any of these markets, Dallas is a pretty well-developed market. Again, your experience is uh, you know, you're buying multifamily. You're not buying a single family from a seller who has no clue. So most of these assets go through some kind of marketing, even parking listings, but sellers are not complete idiots. Most of them are sufficiently sophisticated. So without broad distress, getting these type of deals in any reasonable volume is like, okay, it's, a, it's everybody talks about it, but can't find so again, the markets you talked about, um, what are you seeing today? What opportunities? How are you finding these great deals? Uh, and, and how many deals you've been able to do? We're recording this in late, you know, mid middle of November, twenty twenty three. Episode mm -hmm. will come out probably, you know, not not too late from now. But what have you found this year? What, what have you done this year? Just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I agree with your commentary. I mean, especially on the self storage side, I mean, that is. Uh, such an interesting tale, you know, just to, as a brief aside on the storage front, I was attracted to it back in about 2018, 2019. That's when we started getting more focused on it um, as like a sister asset class in a way to how we wanted to go and deploy capital in our, and help our investors look at the right stuff along with multifamily. Um, in having self-storage peak in terms of appetite and competition, uh, at least appetite within 2021 and looking at it now, uh, really, really just fascinating because we, you know, we've built our whole business in a way that it's really through the lens of the passive investor. Cause that's how I see things still like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an LP. Right. And that said, I rely on taking our time over the course of months and years to get to know great sponsors that are out there looking for the deals because I, I will fly out and look at assets, but I'm not the one making the offer on that property. They're, they're the ones working, putting that sweat equity in to go compete to penetrate the market, to build those broker relationships, to go down the Rolodex with them and make sure they get, they get the first look at these very scarce deals that are sitting out there currently. And so thankfully we've put the legwork in and the groundwork in over the past years, you know, so we've had the fortune to have uh, great sponsors. We already know send us occasional deals throughout the year, you know, so we've, we've done four, four multifamily deals to, to date this year. And we work with a couple of self storage partners right now. Um, and so the, you know, I can't go further into detail without oversharing, but I'll just say that like, that's been, uh, you know, knocking on wood again, grateful to have the partners that are out there. So we were able to take a look at multiple deals coming from multiple partners who are, have fought and looked at hundreds, uh, to find that one and actually win, uh, you know, 
on some of those deals, you've got those, you know, no, no new, uh, new updates here for you, Mike, because you're already across all this stuff and you watch the market, but like a couple of them had assumable debt, right? Um, that's really helpful on the multifamily stuff on the storage side, you know, folks getting creative because it's just too darn competitive to go find that asset. That's like under undervalued. You're not going to find like a deep discount. So the, who's doing well is the folks that can still do some kind of heavy value add or expansion to current facilities in markets. They already know have the fundamentals, even if they don't look as killer in year one, they have very strong pro forma within the next two to three plus. So it's, it's those creative looks at the self storage front, I think from people who already have the track records, right? A lot of this is not the brand new players in storage. It's the folks that have been there for at least a few years. They've got the infrastructure. They're sitting already at the top, you know, top 20, uh, top 30 in the self-storage operators nationally. Um, these are not brand new comers into the space, right? And, and so th those are the advantages, uh, competitive advantages necessary in order to get the access to the assets in the current environment, which is why I'm just grateful that we have been putting in this hard legwork over the past years in capital to, to get to the point where we have that, that access. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And certainly we love value add concepts. If you've got a strong operator, the value add can make all the difference. Uh, yeah. uh but it's a it's a function of the execution. But it, you said something really interesting, and I I I'd like to dive a little bit more into that conversation. So we've seen folks approaching us with these deals with assumable rate debt. And we're pretty similar to what you do with capital allocators. And uh you put it from the lens of the passive investor, I put it from the lens of a fund manager, the concept is the same that they're looking for great deals. And everything I looked at with assumable debt looks like uh and I mean this with all due respect, uh sort of an overpriced asset. And the reason um I I I, I say this is because the seller is selling fixed rate assumable mortgage as an asset. They're basically mm. saying, hey, pay me a higher price because you're going to get more predictable cash flow because I got this uh, assumable debt, which is true. Um, so you have more predictability of the cash flow, but you're not getting a deep, deep discount. It, it would be highly rare where there's a fixed rate assumable debt and the seller is capitulating and just giving away the farm completely. Uh, what is more common is you go bring your own financing. Uh, I got to sell, but I don't have great debt because if I have great debt, I'm I'm not going to capitulate the same way um, uh, those who are under pressure. Because think about it. If they have fixed rate, uh, great debt, they don't have to sell. Like, I mean, they can hold off and a lot of them are. So those who, who are bringing the, these deals to the market, they usually... Um, not discounting them heavily. I mean, they're, they're probably offering some discount, but they're saying, hey, look at this debt. You can't get it today. So it's at an attraction point. So I'm just curious, what's been your experience with a few deals that you've transacted? Um, how much of a discount do you think you got versus, uh, or maybe you didn't get that much of a discount? I know it's not a not a trivial conversation. I mean, you people underwrite for a five-year plan as long as numbers look like they look to pencil. They may not need the massive discount immediately. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on the subject? Because it's a, it's a very interesting uh, conversation with simple debt, and and it makes a lot of sense if you can get the right price for it too. Yeah, I mean, I think you just hit virtually every point, and I'm not sure how much is left to make on it, Mike. Um, <laughs> but you could. <can> still... <laughs> Sorry, you know, I, and I, and I mean that. So I'm not sure where else you want to take it right now. No, but I'd love to hear your thoughts because uh, you actually did those deals. I, I looked at a couple and I said the price doesn't look good enough for me. Uh, so we, we just kind of passed and you did a few. So it's an interesting, just, you know, how do you know you got a good deal? Like, well, I think what, what, what makes you feel like it's a good deal or a great deal? I mean, I think in the end, I'm probably not going to satisfy the level of transparency that you might look for because for a couple of reasons, I'm registered with a broker dealer. So I can't go into certain things at a level of depth that you might want to satisfy here, Mike. Um, but I'll also say it this way. Um, Discount is one of the most subjective terms I've ever seen as a guy coming from tech and coming into a real estate industry of very confident people saying that they think it's a it's an objective term. <laughs> so discount to two people I've never seen mean the same thing. Have you? Well, it, yeah, it, it's a function. But the way I think of it, uh, discount, if you can buy something that's worth $100 today in cash, uh, if you can get it for $80 or $90, and there's a reason why you're getting it. That's a discount to me to the fair as is market value today. You're basically buying deep. I, I've seen the situations where we've invested into deals where distressed seller uh, was defaulting to the bank and the bank just wanted to get that money out. And there mm. was uh, essentially 
situation where the bank allows a suitable mortgage. We, we've done those deals. Like literally you can take over an existing mortgage, just get rid of this uh, owner because they're not, you know, they're not operating the asset well. So that kind of situation, uh, it, 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 there is a meaningful discount because the asset is distressed, right. uh, but the debt is good, right? The asset is underperforming, uh, but the debt is solid. The The other example of a discount uh, is, um, you, you've got, I mean, the classic discount is the property is appears to be performing, but not, but underperforming what the comps are doing in the market. So can right. you slightly improve the positioning of the property on top of that? Can you do renovations and all that stuff? Right. So almost value added is required. You don't have to buy it at a ridiculous discount to the, to the market, but at the same time, what is the market? The biggest right. struggle. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts when you're underwriting today, how do you underwrite future value? Because mm. the interest rates have have done it, the, the 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 fast and furious increase, and then the somewhat long term bond retreated a little bit from the peak, but there's still humongous volatility and uncertainty. So I'm just curious from your perspective, how do you look at the future values? How do you look at the future cap rates? Yeah, I think yeah, I appreciate you expanding on the question from earlier. You know, so to answer the question more directly, you know, NOI business driven business plan for value add folks they just haven't executed on it. Um, you know, th that has been the case, you know, for the, the assumable loan deals is like, they just dropped the ball literally. Like, like they did not execute. They did not actually go and reno the units that they were, in, uh, that they needed to, uh, to hit the business plan. And therefore they, <laughs> they were so far behind that they couldn't actually go back and say, look at our NOI. They were multiple years off of their pro forma. Um, so even if the debt was good, no one else really saw the opportunity because they hadn't done it and they became aware of that. So they had to, they had to sell. Um, on the terms of future value, and sorry about the background noise, Mike, I wasn't expecting us to go past the hour. So I think our gardener's coming here. Um, but we, right now, I think we're looking at some of the the same fundamentals, you know, that we have the last few years, but just through a more conservative lens. Like when it comes to rent increases on it, like a value add deal, I think back to 2020, it's a helpful benchmark, right? Like I look at the COVID year, first half, second half of COVID, all these pro formas you'd look at across the market, the first half, you'd still be seeing those year one, 3% increase year. I mean, more aggressive folks are putting like 5% year increases uh, for the rent increases across the pro formas. Second half of 2020, two different tails. You would see zero, right? You would see zeros in there. You'd see like 0% rent growth assumed on a five-year pro forma year two, year one, year two. Right now, future values are based upon the fact that a lot of, if we're going into one of these deals, they're not able to go and move these rents for at least the first couple of years. Right. And so like, that is the type of conservative that I think is more prudent at this point, because we're, we have to be conservative in the way that we're looking at NOI could be pretty soft if you're basing that primarily on the rent increase lever. Um, and so that, that would be like one key uh, difference. I would say it kind of reminds me a bit of the second half of 2020 um, comparing those from two pro formas um, in terms of future value. So those are the, some of the more conservative assumptions that I'm looking for on the underwrites. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we are past the time, so I'm not going to spend much longer going into great depth, but uh, certainly sensitivity analysis uh, on rent growth, on cap rates, on um, other variables make a big difference in the target returns. We're just playing around with uh, one deal or pro forma underwriting and you just move the cap rate 50 basis points up and down. And the results are absolutely gigantic. It's so, it's almost counterintuitive. Uh, if you follow the traditional value investing with Benjamin Graham or Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and you read some of the stuff they've put together, they want margin of safety. They want to buy so deep that uh, no matter what happens, they're going to make money. And a lot of the investments have just not done that. It's just been value add, build a plan, need to execute really well, need everything to go perfectly, then you get your target returns. When you get more than one variables going wrong, it gets so hard. Absolutely. So anyway, yeah, it's kind of like we're back to the little bit more conservative book today, and that's a good thing. Um, nonetheless, um, yeah, just it's, it, it's always good in my view to go back and reread the basics, uh, what is value investing, how it works, and apply it to real estate self-storage, multifamily, whatever else. So 
Appreciate you coming on a podcast and how would folks uh, reach out to you if they would like to learn more a little bit about what you do, uh, et cetera. Yeah. And, and appreciate you having me on, Mike. Um, our website is madisoninvesting.com uh, and folks can go there, find some education or just reach out and set up a time with me to chat and soundboard. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you for coming uh, on the podcast, sharing your wisdom and uh, your journey from high tech to real estate. I think it's a great journey and uh, working, uh, being on the road for two months is a, is a great benefit. So enjoy the journey. Yeah, trying to along the way. You as well, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.